and we're rolling. What's up, hey, folks? Guys. Welcome to episode seven. We got special guest Esoteric in the house. What's up, Esoteric? How you doing, man? We we'll call you Esso for short from now on. All right, I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Yes, yes. How's everything going over there in the East Coast, man? Well, we just had about uh, 12 inches of snow, so I did a little bit of um, shoveling earlier. I shoveled right. out my my uh, my neighbor's driveway. She's an elderly lady, and last time I did that, she brought some dog biscuits over. So that's the uh, that's, there you go, man. That's, that's the hey, we we that's got the a fellow community elder in the house. Esoteric is natural. Yes, we appreciate that, man. Yeah, Elders yeah. of the block. That's what's up. Hey, so uh, man, I I personally have a ton of questions for you. Um, okay. Just just so that you understand where I'm coming from, our lives are parallel from one okay. another. We've okay. done so many similar things, but I'm gonna take my hat off to you, man, because you you've done some wonderful things out there in the hip hop community, and uh, I'm I'm really impressed. It takes a lot to impress me because I'm you know I'm a, a producer and I write and uh, okay. I'm a big fanatic of, of the hip hop genre as well. So what you've done across the board, man, hats off right there. Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah. it. It's a, if, uh, it's a mix of um, uh, passion and, and lunacy. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I feel you on that, man. If, if it wasn't for the music, I'm not really sure if I'd be sitting right here in front of you guys. So I right. feel you on that. It's, it's yeah. a give and take, huh? For sure. Um, so hey, let's let's jump in. You guys are uh, you guys mind starting with 2019? Yeah, 2019. We got, we got the Zarface meets Ghostface album. Yeah, sure, sure thing. So so let let's jump in. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take us back in time. So we'll start with the 2019 project Zarface meets Ghostface. Okay. Uh, personally, man, Iron Claw, Mask Superstars, Listen to the Color, like those are some jams for me. Um, you know, bringing in that the big beat Billy Squire sample uh, right off the bat. That was dope. Um, in, in 2019 to 2013, man, I, I want to say this. Zarface, the music is timeless. You know, you've been doing things prior to it, man, but we're going to go back in time from 2019, man. And it's, okay. it's, it's like when I get there, it's like listening to you guys today. And then you can come back and go forward to 2019, and there you are. It's like it's, it's like the reversible jacket. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's dope. Okay, um, thank you. Hey, so so with the project that you did with Ghostface, man, he's he's one of my faves um, out yeah. there lyrically. Uh, what was your your uh, experience like with Ghostface? Um, working with somebody like MF Doom and then coming into Ghostface back to back, like within a year's time, man. How does that feel coming where you come from to do something like that? Um, I, I feel like we're kind of in a, a place where we're, we're living in it right now. And I'm looking forward to looking back at it as, uh, you know, a very fortunate experience that, you know, I never ever thought would you know, come to fruition. Like right now, we're just kind of in the, making records with Inspector Deck to begin with is something mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, isn't promised. And we're very lucky to have forged a friendship throughout the years to make Zarface something that um, is, uh, you know, keeps us busy. And naturally, working with Deck uh it bolsters us in, in a in a really it puts us in a a good place where we're able to you know connect with ghostface and connect mm -hmm. it almost you know obviously ghostface and deck you know, and doom the rest of the piece are legendary figures you know and mm -hmm. um but to be in in the same room with ghost um is we're, we're just fortunate man and I, and I never thought in a million years that that would actually come true me mm. and, and, and seven l we spent you know with our crew years arguing over wu-tang artists and um 
in the nineties and to, 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 to come to this point where we, we can work with them is, is a, is a real blessing, you know, and, you know, Dak and ghost, they're, they're very, uh, different in ways mm. with the way they articulate things. So, you know, me and deck, we communicate, um, kind of on a similar wavelength where Ghostface, he has said a lot of very interesting things to me <laughs> and, <laughs> and what you hear on records and what you hear in skits and what you read in interviews. I mean, that is ghost and he will talk mm. to you and he will bang a hard right or a hard left and you just have to keep up and mm. i think it's what makes him so special so charismatic um and uh we're, you know we're lucky to be able to make these records with with people of this caliber yeah definitely i hear that man you know it's interesting you say that because i would definitely respond the same way it's just unimaginable to go i man you, you've you've worked with everybody out there all the people that we grew up listening to, you've got records with these guys. And I'm like, man, this it's it's not that it's an indication that you made it, but it's it's just like you just you in it, man. You're hip hop. You're doing <laughs> the music, you're living your life, you you yeah. know, uh, you're living the standards of hip hop. And um for you to get yeah. into that, I don't really see you as like being separate from all of the cats that are featured on your records. I feel like you're just as valuable you came after but yeah made it to that point where it's like you earned your stripes your stars you know what i'm saying um, i appreciate that man yeah you, you're that. you're one of the elders out there too you know what i'm saying um yeah people could learn a lot from what you're doing so uh thank you for doing what you're doing uh for sure it, for it's sure, a big man. deal yeah the grays in our beard man i see what you mean as uh, we're living a similar similar lifestyle man yeah we're on the that too, that too. I'm, I'm a little bit ahead of you in in the uh you know years uh live but um man okay it, it's you know what like, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna debate that i'm just gonna let you know nah. that i don't want to get into numbers <laughs> <laughs> there you go lex might know my actual age but we'll see oh yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were we were youngest <laughs> back then, running around the city of Boston, getting shots here and there. Yes, sir. For those that don't know, uh, Shay and I, we we know each other from back in the '90s. Uh, we, I was like the guy running around with the cheap camera from from the uh, local video rental school, you know, grabbing shots behind tr in train yards and going to people's houses and gorilla shooting stuff. We got we shot that music video, Mike Mastery, which lives on. Yeah. And um, oh wow, lives on for sure. <laughs> you got some history. Yeah. Did you, hey, Esso, did you ever do some painting? I, no, nah, you know, I, I was actually going through old scrapbooks and stuff earlier um, because I was digging up some basketball cards. I, I guess basketball cards are kind of like popping right now. And mm. my buddy hit me up and asked me if I had the Scotty Pippen, particular Scotty Pippen card that I did. And I came across some old art. And I used to draw like basketball players. I drew hip hop artists and stuff, but I never did graffiti with a, you know, with Krylon or anything like that. Mm, I wish okay. I, I wish I could say I, I did, but uh, yeah. no, nah, I'm a toy when it comes to that shit. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, man. How about the B-boying? <sighs> you're really, you're going to, I just rap, man. All right. I'm an MC. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you Listen. know, some of us, some of us are so nostalgic even at the time of like becoming, I'm saying that you're just like, I'm gonna do it all. I'm gonna be a part of everything. Oh, oh let's, I, I, I didn't mean to mislead you. I, I tried. Okay. Me too, me too, me too. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, I've put a can to okay. a wall and I've tried to write name, but it, it's something that um, fell by the wayside. Mm -hmm. uh, same with like any B-boy type stuff. You know, I, I, you don't want to see me do that. But as far as is emceeing and a little bit of production, um, that's kind of my forte. I think I've been, I, I thrive in a uh, in a booth or or mm. sitting in a chair in front of a, a drum machine or something like that. But as far as getting up on walls or whatever, I got to leave that for 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 the real artists. You know what I mean? I but feel as, you, man. I feel witness, the same way. As a, I was gonna say, but as a witness, though, 
I can attest that Shay, where you grew up near that Beverly wall, that there's a famous wall that all the cats in Boston, the writers would go. And I know he was there coming up in it. And also as far as b-boying goes, I, I remember seeing Shay at a lot of b-boy events and um, back in Boston. And also yeah. one of his, one of, one of the producers that Shay works with a mutual friend of ours, Beyonder, well was named Beyonder back in the day, but Braun, mm -hmm. he can rock the floor pretty well. So props to, nah. props to yeah. He, he might even he might even be a, an honorary member of the Floor Lords, man. From from all all the time he spent with the Floor Lords, and you know he can you know and that, you know that's actually part of it, Lex. With Braun, he covered that. You know what I mean? You know mm -hmm. he would anytime we needed somebody to come out and, and, and bust out some moves, he would be the guy to hold us down, and I could just kind of stand there. And that worked for me. And with that legal wall in Beverly, yeah, I've taken a few pictures in front of it, maybe shot a video, a scrapped video in front of it. But as far as getting up, I just got to leave it to someone more talented, you know? I can just rhyme words, that's it. There you go, well, I mean, you, you've obviously dedicated yourself throughout the years to do that. And, and you're just killing it, you're killing it. So you've dedicated yourself to that area, that, that um, element, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. for you to participate and be a part of that is just as genuine, you know, to support your brothers and sisters out there that's doing the b-boying and b-girling, that you know, oh, definitely. up on the murals and everything. Like, that's the culture that we came up in. Because sometimes you come home, go to the studio, you out at the homies pad, whatever, and you're writing lyrically the same way you would if you were on the floor, same way you would if you were on a wall. But we do oh, it for sure, lyrically, man. you know what I'm saying? For sure, mm -hmm. for sure. And yeah. uh, when a when a, a writer or a b-boy like reacts to one of our songs, I hold it in, in a sort of a different chamber than when an MC tells me they like something. Like if I have, a, mm. you know, one of the, you know, another guy like that I rhyme with or whatever, like say, uh, like Vinny Paz, like, yo, you caught wreck on that verse or something. I'm like, oh, that's dope. But if a B-boy tells me, like, yo, I like that joint because it's like maybe 115 BPM instead of something slow, you know, it puts me in a different, it hits me differently. And I'm like, ah, oh, man, that means a lot. If you can, if you can break to, the, to this record, like, it just, it's a different form of, uh, like, I don't I feel. Appreciation. Yeah, yeah. I it's like, yeah. wow. I feel you. You know, because, uh, you know, I, I know you know. Where, where it all originates from and it just to, to touch someone on that level where you can make a record with it you know they want to move to it it's just different because a lot of the times a lot of our records we set out just to you know say clever things or mm -hmm. you know tell a story but if somebody can actually move to it too or um you know with our face a lot of artists um and with the advent of social media, of course, everyone can get in touch with each other. There are people that draw Zarface on walls and people that, mm. you know, sketch Zarface to warm up or people that, um, it, it, it just, it hits differently, you know? And it's, it, it really, uh, I think, uh, exemplifies the importance of the different elements and how they kind of all can kind of uh, coexist and, you know, interact on the same energy level. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I like just, that, man. I like yeah. your perspective and, and where you come from and, you know, you're genuine with it. You're humble about it. Uh, but at the same time, lyrically, you're a beast. You know what I'm saying? Like the braggadocia is a part of what we do. We're not on the floor. We're not on a wall. But, ah, <laughs> you know, I'm going to pin this to death. So oh. I feel it, man. You represent <laughs> you. out there. Um, yeah. One little thing I want to touch on, one of the elements, there's more than four, but so 7L, the story says that uh, he had contacted you from hearing you do a, a, a DJ set at a, a radio station. So yes, were sir. you DJing prior to writing? Yeah, I feel like um, DJing on a very, very uh, remedial um, novice level. You know, um, because I started off, uh, I think as we all do it, as fans of the culture, fans of the music. And, you know, some of the first records I bought, you could only buy, well, you couldn't only buy on vinyl, but 
be easy to mm. buy them on vinyl at that point, the like right. mid to late eighties, you know, you could go to a record store and get Ice T's first album on vinyl just as easily as you could get it on, on tapes and CDs weren't even out yet. Nope. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess that might, you know, tell you how old I, I might be, but um, CDs weren't even a thing until like maybe a couple of years later. I don't, I don't think so anyway, but whatever. I wasn't thinking about CDs. I was thinking about tapes mm -hmm. and vinyl. So if somebody like, um, if the Jungle Brothers, if I couldn't get the cassette, I'd go for the cassette first because I had a radio, but mm -hmm. if I couldn't get the cassette, I'd get the vinyl. So eventually I would, I would put the record on a turntable and some type of a turntable slash dual cassette hybrid. And, you know, then I fell in love with dropping the needle on a record. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. this is dope. And back then, as you guys know, all that information wasn't available to you and you had to, it was trial and error, yes. you know, to make a pause take or to, to even blend a record. Like it was, mm -hmm. you couldn't just go on, uh, you know, on a, a YouTube and, and Grandmaster Flash or somebody's gonna break it down for you. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> I mean, it was, you guys know. And um, so eventually I got, I, I had a radio show uh, yeah, a, a radio show, and um, I play records, independent records, main, not mainstream, but underground records. Then there was no, I don't think there was really a such a fun, such a distinct line between an underground record and a mainstream record because this was the '90s and it was uh, you know early '90s. Um, and then Seven L would call up and request records. And I was like, oh shit, this guy wants to hear Ultramagnetic MCs. This guy wants to hear mm. Main Source or whoever. And I was like, this guy knows knows what's up. And then he told me he produced. And I said, what do you mean you produced? Only people like, you know, Marley Marl or Premier or whoever they produce. What do you mean you produce? You make beats? <laughs> and uh, he was like, yeah, I, I have an SP 1200 and I make beats. And I was like, oh my God. Well, I, you know, I rap. And you've probably heard me freestyle on the radio. I, I You know, when we have the, and uh, we connected that way. And uh, it, was a, it, was, it was a long time where I held making a record as, as just some un, unattainable uh, thing that was, it was like magic if you could make mm. a record yeah. Or, or, yeah. or even record yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. I would record myself on a tape player in my bedroom, but it was like, it's not real. Yeah. And then he was like, yeah, we can go to just book a studio in Boston and record. And I was like, what do you, we can re like get in front of in a real studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go do that. And then yeah. we started making demos and, uh, and then we uh, met up with um, this guy, Truth Elemental that, that founded Brick Records. And he was like, yeah, we're going to put this on vinyl. And I was like, you like really put it on vinyl, like on vinyl, we could hold this record. <laughs> yeah, we do this. Mine's well, just gonna... alone, man. You're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he's like, we can even make a, a, a colored version of the vinyl. <laughs> and, and you know, I, I we really owe a lot to, to Truth from Brick for being that catalyst in that sense and showing us that mm -hmm. we can do this. And then it led to us pressing records and driving to New York going into Fat Beats and saying, you got to buy this record. And, you know, them actually coming in on orders and buying vinyl, stocking the vinyl in Fat Beats or um, going to Big Daddy Distribution in New Jersey where, you know, they buy X amount of records and ship them out. And then, holy shit, I, we were part of this independent scene that um, we were just uh, making our way through. And I don't know, it became a career for us. Yeah, there you go. Speaking go. of humble beginnings, sorry, Scrab. Sorry about that. I was going to say, speaking of humble beginnings, Shay, you remember back in the day, being from Boston, we would take road trips to New York and we would get into fights in the car about like who's been in New York the most. <laughs> yes. I mean, that, that's the type of, that, that is the type of thing going back to what we were talking about earlier, that, that, level of argument is the type of thing that makes working with people like ghosts or deck or doom you know just this um uh, un uh once an unattainable thing it, 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 having become a reality it makes us very appreciative of you know being able to do that and 
those type of arguments. It's just because kind of mm -hmm. New York is the mecca for, for us mm -hmm. on the East Coast. You know what right, I mean? I know, right. you know, it's, it's different in the West, but I mean, that was really the birthplace for us. And um, it was more, um, I don't know, it was trickier getting out there than it is now, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, definitely uh, big up to the DJs. Sounds like Seven played a major contributing role uh, in, in what you guys eventually became, you know what I'm saying? Like, what, if it wasn't for the DJ, I feel Definitely. like we wouldn't have our voice, man. So big ups, thank you to all the DJs out there. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, that's, that. our friendship was forged on our affinity for the same things, but my level as a DJ is nowhere near 7L. So, I mean, he's, yeah, he's a major factor in uh, everything that we do. Did Seven ever do some rhymes at the time that you guys met? He certainly did. Yeah, he mm. sure did. Um, I I actually have some on a cassette, and um, mm. he was really dope. He was very uh, natural. He was natural on the mic in a, in a way that I I couldn't have been then. And mm. but he didn't. He wasn't. Uh, he didn't like his voice that much, so he stopped rhyming. But he was uh -huh. more on the. Um, his voice was probably somewhere in the realm of like a Milk D from Audio 2 mm. or like Mike D from the Beastie Boys. It was just a very high pitched thing that he wasn't comfortable with. But his delivery um, and his cadence was, it, it spoke to his rhythm as a DJ. Like, yeah. you know, some people, that's why, you know, people talk about the best producers on the mic mm. because. I think producers get it inherently. There's a there's a, a flow, and uh, sometimes it takes a while for an MC to catch on to that type of a flow that might just be in somebody. And you have to work on your cadences and practice flow patterns and stuff. But some people just get it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They can do both. Like Large Professor. Large right. Professor makes a beat like incredible production, and he's one of the most natural, gifted New York. MCs that ever walked the earth and it's just like he gets him you know it's just in him right you know what I'm saying right. man I love the backstories man I love it because it's it, <laughs> like I said nostalgia I don't know man you know at our age our age group right now it's kind of like you know I was going to say earlier don't you miss the vinyl and the, the the cassette tapes and the boxes and everything I miss that whole culture because that was the culture it's completely yeah. just digital now, which kind of, I'm, I'm going to get into that in a minute. Um, going back to 2018, you know, the, the project you did with MF Doom. Making it was um, a lot of fun and it was very um, uh, daunting too because we made a few of the records and we started before the record even came out. There were people approaching us about licensing mm -hmm. certain songs for movies and, and things like that. They didn't, it didn't come to fruition, but it had us more guarded about uh, using samples and, you know, quirky samples that couldn't be cleared and running into legal like entanglements that way. And we wanted to avoid that. So it became a pretty st stressful situation where we were trying to make um, records that you know, incorporated the same type of thing that made our early stuff and, you know, Doom stuff special and kind of find some common ground in a lot of the stuff that we love. And a lot of the stuff that we love is rooted in um, 70s and 80s animation, mm -hmm. 70s and 80s uh, soundtracks and, and mm -hmm. things like that. So putting it together was, um, and keeping it on schedule was very uh, tricky. And we were able to pull it off. And I'm happy that, that the, um, re the record exists the way it does. And, mm -hmm. you know, even putting the art together um, because Doom was a uh, very, he's very um, particular about his likeness and his imagery and I, I respect respected that a lot about him. And the way the record was originally formatted to come out, it was, you know, uh, the way that I pitched it to him was a Czarface uh, versus Metalface record. And he was like, ah, I want to do Czarface meets 
metal face. Mm -hmm. So we're like a team instead of going at each other. And that said a lot to me, man. I was like, oh, all right, you want to be on it? like teammates <laughs> let's yeah. do let's do let's do that you know okay so i'm happy to do that and and um you know his idea was to be very um just more unified than against each other even though it was just like a marketing thing to say versus i never took it literally like a real face off but it was like he had the idea of making it uh, a team up, uh, like a team up thing instead of a a square off fight thing and uh right. so we're grateful for that and uh always you know doom is uh he's one of those guys that you know whether he's here in the flesh or not will live forever so you know yeah, being definitely. able to work with him is, is uh a big deal you know yes man thank you for all of that uh that was that was really cool stuff it, it's it's great to hear um you know people's stories man and, and and i appreciate everything that you went through uh, just a minute ago you're talking about we can go to a studio and record what we could press it on vinyl <laughs> and now you got right. AF doom telling you to be on his team come on <laughs> man what's next yo <laughs> what's well, next but see there's a lot of years in between those two i know things, i know, know i know i'm, I'm, it, I'm it's all truncated right now but yeah man so 2017 <laughs> man first weapon drawn yeah here it goes it was it was this is a this is the portion of what you said um you're talking about releasing that project at a time when music was at its most disposable and accessible uh time in the digital era digital realm yeah so with that being said like what are the the differences when you first pressed in 96 and how you felt about that culture and and what we're doing analog and then what's going on today even after yep. 2017 yeah well i feel like um we are uh as, as our face i feel like we're fortunate enough to have a a, a following that still buys vinyl so mm -hmm. to make a, a record like first weapon drawn that comes with a comic book that you know um we uh, were adamant about including in it that I that I wrote and put and put that out for people and collectors that want to own that and not just stream it. Um, I think that puts us in somewhat of a, a unique place. I know the vinyl market is it's actually spiking right now, mm -hmm. but in terms of the money to be made, because is significant because you get a lot more off of a vinyl sale than you would. Mm -hmm the streaming as you know but even today when i was out walking the dog i just pop on spotify and i listen to whatever you know whatever i want the ease of it is just it, you can't argue with it you i mean i am a purist i want to keep the culture alive i want to keep mm -hmm. physical product in people's hands there's nothing more rewarding you know we come from that era where you buy a tape you buy a record you open it up and you look at the credits you see these guys produce records. You see somebody produces nine records on a song and uh, another guy produces the next two or two random joints. Who's that guy? And you can, you know, follow his work from there on. That stuff is important. Whereas, you know, if you put out a record today on Spotify, like you personally, I could listen to it, appreciate it, but maybe the producer might, you know, I might have to dig a little deeper. Mm. And I think when you have a digital, um, I, I think that's why producers have been, you know, started tagging their beats as often as they have. Not every producer, but, you know, they all have their like static selector or whoever mm. it might be. They might have a little yeah, tag. A little watermark this. thing. Yeah. 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 A a a Alchemist or P -P -P Premier, whatever it is. No, well, Premier doesn't do it. He does that on the radio show, but it's, I don't know. There, there's, the ease of hearing whatever you want makes the music seem to be a little more disposable. So the lifespan yeah. of a record can be three hours, could be three weeks. So somebody listen to a record in three weeks that's not like super passionate about it. It's like a casual listener or fan. They listen to a record for three weeks. Uh, you're, uh, you made a dent. I mean, some of the 
the records that were so important to me, you, whoever that uh, is still in this for so long, you would buy the tape and you would ha have that tape and appreciate it for what it was. You would let it grow on you and it would be part of your memories, your life experience. Man, we were listening to we were listening to Midnight Marauders when we were going to New York that time, or we were listening to EPMD, like Strictly Business in high school, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Those type of things, you can't just drag and delete it. It's uh, you know your tape for that that time frame, and you would play it until the the, the ink wore off, or mm -hmm. you know you'd have a dub of it or whatever it was. You know you could stream and listen to hey, it's pretty dope, but then you might move on to the next one. They're like that shit is solid, but. I don't know. There were less artists then too. It was just, the, or less artists with, with deals that right. uh, you were able to purchase music from. You came in at a good time. I don't know. I don't know if I answered your question. No, you you did. You did. Like you 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 talked about the differences, and that's really all I was wanting is like your feel on it. You know that quote meant a lot to me. Just that little that little portion of that quote because yeah. I say it. It it it's such a different time. I used to walk through the park with a record in my hand and everybody run up to me and I'd be able to sell my records by hand that quick. You yeah. can't do that digitally the same way and get the same response, but. Um, no, you can't, you can't. It's a, it's a, it's a, a different, I remember um, Rocksteady uh, anniversary in like 96, maybe 95, 96, it had to be 96. I was able to hand my record to Prince Paul or our, you know, our first record, hand it to him and like, that was, wow. I just gave my record to Prince Paul and never thought right. anything of it. And then he called the 800 number on the label and was like, hey man, pause, I'm gonna say the shit is dope. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and that was, that, that might've been a month and a half later, yeah. you know? It, it was like, a, uh, that he actually put the record on the turntable and, and was inclined just to call and just say that. Like, it blew my mind. And, you know, I know today you can put out a record and maybe tag him on it, like mm -hmm. in a way, and maybe he'll hear it right. somehow. <laughs> but it's just, uh, it's very, uh, it's just a different, different world. And I guess you have to adapt to it in a way. And, yeah. uh, you know. I feel like that release uh, happened at a time when what you said was, was going on. I wasn't really out buying records. You know, yeah. people weren't bringing it that were putting out records. So I wasn't going to the record store and buying current music. And you have people yeah. like De La Soul putting out digital albums. So it's yeah. like, damn, where did everything go? Even if I wanted to buy the new album, you're not releasing it on vinyl anymore, you know? And then there's issues with, with labels like Tommy Boy, for example, has got an issue with De La where now their contract didn't establish like the digital era. So yeah. that was like the whole beef and, and, but you doing what you did to put out a soundtrack for Zarface, um, whose idea was that, that, that came up with that? Um, well, it was probably, uh, it was mine and 7 ls in a way, um, yeah. because 7 L was very, um, a lot of the stuff that he enjoys listening to are scores from movies. Um, a lot of stuff he likes making beats from or, or from, you know, mm. movie scores, soundtracks. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, making hip hop records is one thing to him, um, but making uh, like a score, you know, actually scoring maybe a movie would be great. A Fistful of Peril uh, in 2016, another incredible album by Zarface that didn't seem to uh, if we're going back in time, regress with the time that we're, we're moving in, it, it's just as class. It's almost like you guys recorded from 2013 to 2019 all the same day. I don't know how you guys did that, man, but you guys <laughs> stayed on point. Some people don't like artists to wave off and do different things. Yeah. You guys did in so many different ways, but at the same time, there was this particular sound where, like I said, it doesn't get better, but it doesn't deteriorate. It doesn't change to where it's like, ah, I like the other album better. You guys stayed on point. I don't know how you did it. it that's, they talk about the sophomore jinx. Yeah. You guys destroyed it. <laughs> <laughs> there was like no question about a sophomore jinx. 
and then you kept going. You did something that a lot of people have trouble doing, and and maybe it has something to do with the crew. Uh, I say that it's the experience that you guys have from your past and what it means to you to move forward and progress. So, um, 2016, man, a fistful of peril, amazing. Uh, Czar Wars, psh, one of my faves. 2015, every hero needs a villain, deadly class. Um, you guys kept it going. If we go back to 2013, when you guys first started Zarf Face, um, Poise had an, uh, a question for you. Let's start off with Poise and his question. Oh, hey, what's up, bro? Hey, man. Right? Good to right. hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, yeah, actually, Poise. Yes, sir. Yeah, I actually have two questions. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go with the first one first. Um, in today's music, especially concerning hip hop, uh, us being MCs, of course, and you have you know a lot of rappers out now with this repetitive rhythm that they all use, you know, and so on and so forth. Not bashing the youth, but uh, they have this new this new app that's out right now called Clubhouse, where all the celebrities are on, a lot of producers, and they'll play three. They have a lot of contests also. And they also give a lot of uh, good information. You know, they give a lot of good information. But some of the some of the rooms in there, they're they're fake. You know, and some of these people are are world renowned, famous producers. And they'll play like they'll have people play their music, and they'll play three songs, and all three of those tracks will be in that same repetitive, you know, flow style with the same pitches, so on and so forth. And all the judges will be like, "Fire, fire! Oh, that's fire!" You know. <laughs> and my question to you is, uh, us being who we are and, and the world, how it has changed uh, digital, digitally, uh, as far as the new energy, you know, the new hip hop energy, so on and so forth. What can we do to keep uh, outside of being, continuing to be who we are and keeping our standards, you know, uh, to where they are? What can we do to, I don't want to use the word sway because that's not what I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, but what can we do to, to help uh, keep hip hop in its purest form? And I'd use that word lightly because today, you know, where we're living, yeah. uh, how things are going, but what can we do as, as, as MCs and, and people of hip hop who have actually lived through hip hop, who walked around with cardboard boxes looking for people to battle, you know, and so on yeah. and so forth to keep our form pure. Now me, I, I, made a, I made a decision a couple of years ago to stop uh, applauding certain people who are basically boo-boo, you know, on stage. If you're boo-boo, I'm not gonna applaud you. And, yeah. and I refuse to work with certain people that are not at a certain level of East MC-ism, you know, if that's a, a word, or, or, or mc you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that's gonna cause a little conflict a little later because there's gonna be certain artists that you know I may want to work with or they may want to work with me and I'm gonna have to find a way to let them know that you basically have to raise your level a little bit, you know. But that's my first part of the question. And my second part of the question to you is at what moment uh and what age did you know that you were gonna become an MC or 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 also when did you to add to that, when did you know that this is something you wanted to do for the rest of your life? I was actually forced into a rap battle uh, while I was fighting a case. I never had a, never wanted to be a rapper. I probably would have ended up becoming an R&B singer because music runs in my family, but <laughs> never thought in a million years I would become a rapper from, from right. a battle that I was forced into. So that's what made me, you know, an MC. That, that, that was like an 85. So those are my two questions for you. You say 85? Yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, uh, yeah. I just had a birthday Saturday. I'm 54. <laughs> okay. Oh wow. All right. Yes, sir. Wow. All right. Well, that salute. Um, so you're in a battle in '85? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was in a county the jail in the LA ever. County, which was actually deemed the worst county in the United States at that time. So that's okay. when gang banging. I'm from LA, from South Central Los Angeles. That's when gang banging was at its height. Yeah. And, the short version of the story is that I had previously wrote like a few lines about a girl I had met on the streets, you know, one day and made me pissed off over some shit that she did. And, 
and I find myself six months later fighting a case, a very serious case in the county jail. And okay. uh, my cellie heard me saying these lines and it was a crip upstairs rapping one night. And I don't, I, you know, my cellie yells out, out of the bars, hey, my cellie will eat you up, you weak as fuck. You know, and I, I give them that look like, what the hell are you doing? You know, don't say, you know, be quiet. I don't want to rap against this dude because if he loses, he, he might want to fight. And as, as you know, with gangs, you don't get a fair fight, you know? Yeah. So uh, the guy stopped rapping for a few seconds and uh, he started back rapping. So I'm like, woo, I made it, you know, <laughs> like I made it. And then my cellie does the same shit. He yells up there again. And then this time the crip yells down, hey, cuz, who is your cellie? You know, basically putting me on the spot. And, and I tell people, this is a real funny story, but it's a serious story. Had I not responded, the guys would have saw that as a sign of weakness. And yeah. the next day when the bar is open, they would have been coming trying to rob me. So I basically, uh, from that night on, after I won my first rap battle, I, I never lost for two and a half years. I literally rapped for my ass, <laughs> you yeah. know, in the county. Well, that'll so, do it. Yeah, for sure. Wow. Let me think real quick. Like, it had to be no later than 90. It was 89, 90, something like that, because I know, like, Ice-T's first few records, Public Enemy's first few records, Run DMC, Strictly Business was out. Uh, Ultra Mag's first album was out. Definitely had a few singles before that. They're, these are the type of things that made me, that set me on the path that I'm still on. And it's it's still it. records like that, like working with somebody like Cool Keith today is just like mind really? shattering to me. It's not, <laughs> it's not something that I would ever get tired of doing. And yeah. you just get into this 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 point in life where it might be, I always say that 1986 to 1994, 95, maybe 96, that decade um, might as well have been 50 years in terms of hip hop's it, uh, impression on me it, it, and probably all of us. It just let, it, it was like a, um, from 87 to 89, the difference between styles or say 86 to 89 was just more than we could really comprehend. I think looking back at it, whereas if you take a record from 2011 versus a record from 2014, it doesn't quite seem that different. Now, maybe in 2021 or whenever a little pump or whatever came out, it might seem like a very different animal. But there was a, a good solid 20 years where it was it was tangible. Now it is something that's very different than I, I think the vibe and the energy can be there on a lot of the records, but it, it, it's a very different uh, thing. And I think I'm trying to remember the questions on the fly, but I try to put myself in a place of understanding where the youth is making their music. And as you said, uh, on, on Poise on, on Clubhouse, if you play three records for somebody and they all sound very similar and everyone's reacting to it, like, yo, that's fire, that's fire, that's fire. I try to look at it like if we're listening to three records from 1988 that are all sampling the same drum break from Clyde Stubblefield, whoever, you know, if it's a, it's a Honey Drippers record or James Brown record, and they're all within like 100 BPM, our parents might listen to that and say, all three of these records sound the same. And I'm like, no, they do not. They ha Are you kidding me? Do you hear Kane on this record? Do you hear Rakim on this record? Do you hear the difference in their, in their flow? Whereas a, like a 13, 14 year old kid right now, they're like, are you kidding? G Herbo, you saying G Herbo sounds like uh, the baby or something? And like, I don't know. It's, 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 it's something that I have to defer to. I have to let the youth kind of figure that out because for sure, for sure. I, I'm married to the earliest recordings of hip hop, whether it's Kaz, Busy B, mm -hmm. uh, the Z3, whoever it is from that era where you could just get this, the records on cassette. And if you yeah. had a vinyl, it's like, forget about it. It might've been a bootleg. You don't know what it, where it came from, but the, the live shows to the mid nineties to like Midnight Marauders or 
93 or you know souls of mischief's first record is, it, is the album called 93 to infinity i don't yeah, know that's yeah. It. Yep. the whole album yeah um that's when i was the most sponge like just absorbing mm -hmm. everything loving everything that i heard and and everything that we do now describe to what you had said how our stuff kind of stays on the same path it's a reflection of you know the the records that we've been the most inspired by and right. trying to spit the perfect verse trying to get the perfect rhyme down are you happy with that 16 is it perfect to you maybe but is there a little voice in your head saying i don't know if you play this for somebody like uh i don't know uh nas is he going to be nodding his head too i don't know right. You have to get into the mechanics of emceeing and the mechanics of what makes an artist stand out. There's just like, I don't hate the new music that comes out. I don't listen to it, but I try to put myself in a position of a younger kid and where their head is at. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it's just, it, it's tough to get a hold of because it's all, it has to do with time. And time is something you can't hold. And if you're trying to put it together and, and hold it, I, it's it's impossible. So I, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard That's to figure point. out. That's a good point, man. I, I like that answer because it's you're talking about what you just can't help. It's not our problem. Uh, <laughs> like 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 exactly what you said. We're the, I told Poise that you. I said we're the new parents talking about this stupid rap music. <laughs> yeah. This cool rap. Yeah. And like this stuff's ridiculous. There is some some truth to how it is going downhill in a trend, though. Um, music in general, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, that's without saying, like you said, just steer clear. And I think that's probably the ultimate answer that you're given is just don't participate in it. Let it take its course. Yeah. And and stick with our standards over here. And speaking of standards, I'm gonna get back on you with that. Um, so what you said, uh, who would you say would be kind of like father to your style, maybe? Someone that you were like, I got to get to that level lyrically. Uh, and I want you to name someone before the 90s. Oh, oh, oh before the 90s. Because I'd say Deck. Deck is, right. is Deck, you know, and it's not just because we've made a bunch of records together. Mm -hmm. Deck was my favorite rapper before we did Zarface. You know what I mean? Right. We, we, it, it's just something about a style. I'm like, wow, that is the most New York lyrical, wow. just abrasive, um, wild emceeing in its in its essence. And uh, so, Deck would be would be that guy. But before the '90s, uh, Cool Keith, Paris Smith, Eric Sermon, um, Guru. Okay. You know, I know a lot of Gangstar records um, were big in the 90s, but Guru was doing his thing here in Boston uh, in the 80s. Yep. Um, I, you know, in the first record with Premier, I, I think that came out in 89. Um, I, this type of stuff is so special to all of us. I'd hate to leave anybody out, so I'm thinking about it. Um, you know, I'd say before 90 would have to be KRS, EPMD, both of them, um, Rakim, Kane, Bismarck, Key, you know, um, Daddy O from Stetsasonic, the whole Stetsasonic crew. crew <laughs> That's a trip. It's true though, because, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, they put out some, some very, uh, important records to me then right. Cutting and then Kwan goes and joins the Gravediggers and shines on the Gravediggers record mm -hmm. and that you know the RZA Prince Paul thing completely different record it, it right. sound everything you know and, it, and that was only over the six years where you, you where you take where Stetsasonic was and then goes into the great the Gravedigger record, it's just, I don't know. It's that's six years. That's why I say this whole thing between the, the records that we grew up on, it's longer than a decade or two. It, it seems like right. like a century. Right. Because it just it blows my mind. Whereas you take somebody like, I don't know, like the Nelly era of rap. It's like if Nelly came out now, 
doing like some type of horror course style would blow your fucking mind, but it would still be like 20 years of 20 years difference. <laughs> your analogies are the best, man. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, who, who are you? Who are your influences as far being on the West Coast as far as like MCs from the late 80s, early 90s? It's interesting you say that because that's what I wanted to kind of touch on it, but I was going to leave it alone. Um, I'm from New York. Oh, yeah, okay. I grew up most of my life in the West Coast in San Diego. And okay. so, you know, we're influenced by L.A. Yep. prior to us having our own folks, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But um, at the time, man, it was like whatever was played on the radio, whatever was happening in the in the B-boy circles. Um, so it's it's like all of the, the the music that wasn't necessarily recognized as like the battles and the lyrics. You know, you got the MC Shan uh, back in the day. That's and the thing. That like Shan, really, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to leave out Shan. Like uh, Shan is huge yeah, to was, me. Was, yeah. Huge. And that, that I left him out, and now I'm, I feel bad about that. I got like I feel like <laughs> rhyming. I help down by law for you right now, just to just to tell you how, how important he was to me. <laughs> you know, like anyone, <laughs> anyone of the Juice Crew, right? G Rap, like K, right. whoever, right? Craig G. Right. Continue. I'm sorry. So, so I mean, but see, you okay? So you you know what I'm talking about? It, it's it's strange because I don't have like my roots in New York, but I do. So growing up on the West Coast, especially in San Diego, where we just got the beach, we got TJ right down the street. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We live in Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. It was a different culture, so we had a lot of the gang banging. Uh, even, you know, at the beginning. So it was like, that was the culture that I grew up in was that type of music. But at the same time, you had your preference. And like I said, you go to a party there, you know, we're listening to Dougie Fresh. We're listening to uh, uh, Slick Rick. And so that to me, the storytelling aspects of writing rhymes was the first thing that I got into. Yeah. That was what writing a rhyme was about. And then the LA Underground took me over, you know, Freestyle Fellowship. 1993 was a classic year for all of that in California. Oh yeah. And, and, and hip hop in general, right? But Freestyle Fellowship just said, boom, this is us. This is what a hip hop standard is. Um, and I looked at it like I had to compete with every single one of them LA Underground heads or else I was done. Wow. I wasn't gonna matter to myself that I was lyrically comparable. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then the East Coast didn't have that. They weren't doing the crazy like battle mode um, with the styles that they brought, you know, that were similar to scatting. Um, so okay. with that being said, my influence was New York at the beginning. And then it went quickly to, you know, just before, but mostly 93, when that hit, you know, you go to the, the, the CD store, I think 2011 is when the CD started. And uh, you go in, you're like freestyle fellowship, you know, and you buy the CD because we were just buying everything at that time, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then you listen to it and you're like, wow, what just happened? You know, yeah. and then you start getting into Del the Funky, Homo Sapien, everybody from Hyro. Um, you know, you started going into Far Side. Um, there was all kinds of different styles of hip hop and rap and the beats, uh, but I, I don't want to go on too much, man. But I, no, no, that I mean that was a very question because we grew up with a different sound. It was an exciting time, I think, for the oh, West Coast yeah. at that oh, yeah. point because yeah. you had obviously Dell Souls Casual, mm -hmm. and then you had Freestyle Fellowship, um, the Inner City Griot record, and then you had. Uh, Volume 10 is volume 10 part of Freestyle volume Fellowship? Is a part of, they're a part of the Good Life Cafe, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yeah I mean, that was a, a very exciting time, I feel like, for, for West Coast hip hop, you know, and I, I, Saphir, you know, you had the Saphir mm -hmm. and Casual thing, and mm -hmm. that was a very, uh, that influenced us on the East Coast too, without a doubt. I can't imagine that's an interesting uh, concept to talk about at some point. Maybe we'll have you on just the, the regular program and we'll talk about the differences of, you know, how you were kind of raised and what standards, like, what is your standards? You know what I'm saying? And, and did you meet those standards and did you go above it? Did you create the new standard? 
And I feel like that's what you've done, man, which is an incredible thing because a lot of people, like what Poise was saying, is a lot of people don't even know what a standard is in hip hop, uh, much yeah. less jazz, you know what I'm saying? And then yeah. they won't even progress to that point. They'll stay wherever they are because that's a trend or that's a new way, you know, that's the new, the new, the younger kids, you know? But yeah, for sure. To me, it was like, I wasn't allowing myself to be a part of hip hop culture if I wasn't going to, to learn my standards. And then I wanted to raise the bar. I was like a lyrical beast. Like, I'm not just happy with being here at this BPM, you know, 84 BPM. I got to take it to 116. I got, you know, I got to be able to double time. I got to be able to slow it down, storytell. I got to MC. Uh, yeah. I got to battle. Like, man, like you said, 93 was just like, whoosh, it was a whirlwind of crazy times, man. But like, like you also said, the, the time frame was so yeah. small, but it felt like forever because there was so much expansion we had to do. And you're on point with that, man. I'm telling you, you're my, you're my, uh, my parallel. Yeah. <laughs> man, like i'll break it down to you some other day man but it's insane um, oh i like to hear that man it's yeah, seriously i, I like to hear that i, I, I want to find out more about you too man um let's move into this because this there's a couple things i want to hit and one of them is the super seven reactions are face figure the collectible figure so this is happening right now and the last thing that i caught off of one of your um your your sites your your um platforms was that uh, they're already sold out. Yeah, that's that's nice right there. What what uh, was the date that they hit the street? Oh, they they came out. Um, they 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 sold out within ten minutes of us putting them on the on the site. Nice. That's incredible, yo. <laughs> For real. It's it's very it's cool, man, and it's it's um, something we we created with the Zarface thing. Um, mm -hmm open doors that weren't uh, able to be open, I think, with, say, Seven Illness Esoteric or it just, I grew into, uh, with, with Zarface, I was able to uh, express other things that mm -hmm. um, drove me, you know what I mean? And that comes with the, the, the comic book culture and action figure stuff that I grew up with as a kid before I was even into emceeing and things that gave me solace as a child and things that was escapism thing where right. I couldn't, you know what I mean? Like if, you know, say, you know, my parents were, they split up and it was just like this so much pain there, but I could escape to this world of mm -hmm. action figures and, we're That's all with that, that, man. Yeah. All of us. If, yeah. if it gives you that peace at yeah. that point, it doesn't leave you. And to be able to mix it up now and combine it when I have a son that's, you know, he's 10, now, uh, he's 12 now, but between from five to 12, this whole time where I could bring this Zarface character mm. into his world and relate to him because he's, you know, he's obviously as a, as a kid, he's into toys and things like that. And you can relate to him in that way. Right. When you're working on your career and making music with really your, your heroes, but still be able to talk to him about it because it's all centered around this fictional character of Zarface. And then you can write comic books and put the action figure out. Good. You're balancing this, you're in this weird space where you're on the phone with Inspector Deck from Wu-Tang Clan <laughs> talking about your next record. Right. <laughs> and what are we gonna do this time? And then showing your son uh, the latest incarnation of wh whatever comic we're working on or the action figure and letting him kind of create uh, villains for Zarface to fight. It, I don't know, it's just this space that we somehow created that for us personally, not saying we created it, but it's this thing that we kind of exist in that makes uh, my, I don't know, job fun and worth doing. I don't, I, I don't know what it is. I don't know how to phrase it, but the Super 7 action figure getting that 
to happen uh, was surreal for us. Yeah, I can imagine. That's pretty dope right there, man, to have an action figure. Yeah, and it, it's dope. cool that it's not like you guys personally, because that's a whole different thing. But you guys created a character, and there's your character in, in a little box, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and oh, yeah. It's, yeah. See, I guess that you're, you're right, because I don't want to see an action figure of myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Aquaman figure. You wouldn't want you, you want to get like the Batman or, or, or Iron Man or Wolverine or whoever. You don't want Aquaman. And, you know, I'm just the there. <laughs> you got you gotta me, rock man. some armor or something, you know. Oh, and uh, <laughs> I, I do like Aquaman, but you know, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, saying yeah. a casual guy might not want to get that figure. <laughs> That's hilarious, man. Uh, man, congrats on that action figure. If anybody yeah, out there yeah. wants to get a copy, I think you're gonna have to pay a heavy price. So uh, we've got more coming. I don't think it's part of it. You know, let go of it though. But if they do, you're gonna pay for it. Yeah. So congrats on that, man. Oh, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll see what's up in the future with Zarface, because I think you guys got some more crazy stuff coming too, man. I, I can feel it. Um, so we the last thing that we talked about was, uh, you know, your start uh, roughly, I think you were saying roughly around 89-ish, um, you know, and, and doing the album with Zarface, as Zarface in 2013. Uh, man, let's... I just want to touch on a couple of things so we can get through all of this. Power Records. <laughs> I yeah. remember that, man. Power Records and the read-along uh, book and record. I had all of those things. That's when I first dabbled as a DJ trying to scratch those records. I even had Jack in the Box records. Oh. I don't know if you ever got those in the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, up, you got this real super thin plastic and you yeah. put it in the record player and it would just kind of like, spin because it was so light <laughs> yeah oh definitely yeah 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 for sure i had all for that sure, stuff man. man so when when i learned about you guys using power records i was like that is a super throwback that's incredible you said 7l does a lot of production from um movie soundtracks and and was that his collection as well or was that yours included or, or your idea for power well i, I would say that it, it was his collection mm -hmm. um for sure, because he's got every record imaginable. Mm. But when those records came out, we had those records, you know, on a turntable. We were like, I don't know, younger than 10. Yeah. So yeah. we remembered those records. Yep. And I said, hey, man, do you have any of these? You know, and he's like, oh, yeah, I have the Hulk one. I got this one. I got that one. Because he's a collector. So he has all the records. And I'm like, oh, right. man, let's let's listen to these and let's see what we can do and maybe you could cut some on a record and that was a big part of our the the, the excitement of creating hip-hop like it's it's uh, you know very rewarding to record yourself and, and be happy with with a rhyme that you spit or or beat that, that that you make but adding those little details cutting record cutting a, a certain phrase from Peter Parker or a voice actor that does Peter Parker or whatever and, uh -huh. and making that be a memorable thing in someone else's ear and they don't know where it's from. Mm -hmm. That's part of the excitement of listening to hip hop and exploring right. hip hop and digging into it and trying to research and find out where that came from. And, and um, I think it's, and that that's what made us make the first weapon drawn record because first weapon drawn is, a lot of instrumentals that, that 7 l made, but there's a lot of narration from the comic book. So mm -hmm. when you put the needle on the on the groove, you're gonna hear the 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 comic book, the guy speaking through, but it's all influenced from the power records and Peter Pan records that came out then from the Hulk to Captain America to Star Trek to Godzilla to they, they made so many of them then. Yeah. And but when we heard somebody like uh, you know, ultramagnetic. Maybe, maybe be Mo Love or said she, whoever would be cutting it or sampling it. It was just like, wow, these guys are using the superhero stuff, man. It's so dope. And you know, there's always going to be somebody that that um, inspires you, and, and those guys inspired us in a different way. And it's just like Doom. You know, when you think of Doom, everything that they did with, even from KMD, such groundbreaking things and mm -hmm. 
sample, uh, one of our first records we ever made and put on vinyl was Be Alert and it sampled the Transformers. And, and Lex, obviously, you know, <laughs> Beyonder sampled the, the, the horn break from the Transformers record. And our minds were blown by that and we couldn't wait to rhyme on it. And it was such an exciting time. And I was like, wow, this guy went and sampled the Transformers off a of VHS tape. That <laughs> shit is next level. And it was next level. Yeah. But when you really think about it, there was Doom a couple of years before sampling Scooby-Doo from a thing. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> yes, there's just levels to it. And it just, a lot of that stuff is what excites us when you can incorporate things from our childhood yeah. and almost put yourself into it by rhyming over it or, or just being part of it. It's like, wow, the Transformers theme meant so much to me when I was on the floor of my kitchen alone, it just like <laughs> dealing with rage from like, <laughs> yeah, uh, things you couldn't explain. And, you know, right. you escape to that. And now we're making a song with that music, whether, whether it's cleared or not, we're, we're putting ourselves and being part of it it, it's just, uh, it's therapy in a way. And uh, it is, man. I, I like how you say that. It's, it was part of the escapism, which is another thing that you said. And, and therapy is another a part of that. You know, it's a branch of that. And, and for us to stay childlike, Poison and I talk about this all the time, to stay childlike through your whole life. Yeah. It keeps me young, man. I run around with the kids and out <laughs> now, you know, because I'm a teacher too. And uh, oh, okay, nobody, okay. Nobody can mess with me at my age. You know what I'm saying? Even yeah. the kids can't hang with me. <laughs> Hip hop keeps you young, and it's it it, it's not just physical, but it's like mental because we stay within that that world of like, you know, it's more than just the physical world. Like I'm gonna become a military uh, this guy, or I'm gonna be a pharmaceutical a pharmacist. Uh, like people are stuck on that we kind of have this whole creative thing that we've done and luckily we got hip hop to do it through. I don't know what else we'd be doing if it wasn't for that, you know? And, right. Uh, I, I feel you, man. I, I appreciate what you're saying. It's yeah. all real deal. All of us feel a hundred percent on that. I, I know I could speak for everybody, man. You're nailing it. You're That's, nailing well, it. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's what it is. And it's well said, you know, hip hop does keep you young. And if, 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 if it, if it meant that much to you then, it means that much to you now it's uh, we're, we're lucky to have gravitated towards that sound and, and um, you know, enjoy it for what it is still today. You know, my, my, my son calls me the, the child in charge, which is, uh, <laughs> which is kind of a, that's dope. That's it's, dope. it's, you know, it's good and bad. And I'm like, oh, you know, yeah. cause he knows I'm the boss, but he knows, we kind of, we can relate to a lot of the same stuff. That's anyway. pretty witty for a 12 year old too, man. And, <laughs> and bold to say that to your dad. Yeah. <laughs> Got a good relationship with him for him to open up like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Based on your, on your Transformer piece, man, interestingly, I was touring in, uh, in Scotland at the time. And we're oh, at okay. a DJ slash collector's house and, and, and we came to hang out and uh, he had just got that record. And he played it for us, man. He was going nuts over it. And when I turned around and listened to it, I was like, wow. And, you know, we were we were touring for my first release on vinyl, right? But when, okay. when that played and I'm standing there and I'm listening to a Scottish person play that record, he's a collector and he has it. He had to have that, man. Along with the, the three. Did you know there's a three-sided De La Soul record? Three-sided? Three-sided. No, what do you mean? One I of the know. sides, I'm, I'm blowing your mind right now. One of the sides has two separate entrances for the groove. Oh, okay. Ain't that okay. something? So this dude was a serious collector, man. And he had that record and he was so happy about that that beat, man. Oh, that's. <laughs> so I just wanted to pass that to you. Yeah. So, you know, pass it along. Um, well, you know, uh, Lex, he was there for all of that. He was right in the mix, yeah. and, and that's kind of where when our friendship began. You know what I mean? Right, right. from that that era. So yeah, he he uh, he knows our deepest darkest secrets. Right. Well, I was I was there. <laughs> it was He's uh, younger crazy than me, time. but he was still there. Yeah. <laughs> it was a crazy time running through the streets. 
Yeah. And um, back in the, it was a different era back then. Not like these kids nowadays with like active school shooter drills and pandemic know, procedures huh? and all that craziness, right? Yeah. Like we had a good back then. Yeah, sure, for sure. It's that very different. But yo, while while I'm on the topic, um, actually, I'm gonna change the topic. Uh, speaking of what you were talking about earlier, the soundtracks. Not every soundtrack you use or that that Zarface or even back when it was Seven L and Esoteric, you know, was superhero soundtracks. But the one of my favorite joints y'all you ever did, uh, and big up to to Seven L because I know that he was behind the genius of it. But was the Perfect Person track? Oh yeah, that sampled the Twin Peaks. Let oh, me just point this. I produced that. All right. I sampled that. Oh, he wasn't okay, behind Lex, it. Okay, okay. okay. Lex. He knows a little <laughs> bit. All the deep dark <laughs> secrets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Except for that one. I got, and he I gotta get to the bottom of this. When he when he it watches this, he's gonna understand he knows. I'm he knows more about Twin Peaks than I do, all right. But I was inspired to sample that record and make the beat Okay. And rap about whatever I rapped about there. But <laughs> It's pretty. Are you saying that he was behind it because he's such a Twin Peaks fanatic, or just because he's like kind of the producer of everything we do? Most. Well, that's what I. That's what I thought. So, I thought that yeah. he was behind it because I remember him being such a Twin Peaks fanatic. But, yeah. but more importantly, the reason why I want to talk about that track is because of how personal you got on that track. Just in your, and I think this is before pre. I mean, you know, if we, if we go to, if I'm too invasive, please stop me. But I think this is pre pre marriage, so. I mean, I'm just speaking from a personal level. That song spoke to me in, in many different relationships. So what are your uh, thoughts? What inspired you to write that track? If you don't mind going deeper on some of the inspiration of it. Yeah, it, truthfully, what well, was before marriage, but I mean, it's uh, my wife was <laughs> inspiration. And here she is <laughs> helping me facilitate the the uh the zoom situation here so, so it's like, she wins the whole argument you know because here she is taking care of me as i can't even fiddle out, figure out how to get on this thing or charge my phone in charge yeah. <laughs> yeah um yeah so that was just basically a little bit of a expression of a relationship that was give and take and there was some turmoil in there and frustration and and um I just kind of the song just kind of came out and she's given me a lot of grief about the song but we kind of <laughs> put it in the rear view mirror and it all started with the line I haven't heard it in a long time because I can't listen to our own uh, our own music because I'm too critical of it so I just kind of shut it out but I know I started it about having sneakers by the door there was something about the sneakers and I had because I used to have so many sneakers and I have them all by the door and they would drive her crazy. And she'd get so mad about it. I was like, why does this bother you? And that was the impetus for it. And a lot of it stemmed from that little spat, but we've worked all that out. And um, I hope so, man, that's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that's, that's over, that's maybe 15 years now. Yeah. And uh, we weren't married yet, but um, we're married now and, and if we can get through 2020 and, and what's to come, I mean, uh, we, we got yeah. a pretty good thing going, but um, yeah, yeah, that, that was a, just a, a little period of time that um, uh, I was able to write about something other than squashing MCs and, and, <laughs> and uh, stuff that's, you know, a little less tangible. So I'm, I'm glad that you, you know, related to that song. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, man. It just... now it's going to be uh, uh, the fans are going to bring it back up. We're going to reinvent it or not reinvent it, but we're going to uh, resurface it. So <laughs> don't let your wife know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't worry. That, that, that song is back scared. again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, real quick, man, I, I, I don't want to miss anything on here. So let me talk about 2010 when you did Palin slash Vic. Um, oh, boy. OK. All uh, right. That really hit me because I, I speak out a lot about people out there in the world that want to be representatives, but they just, they, you know, they, they're not capable of doing that, man. And you, you really, you socked it to both of them uh, on that. So I was going to ask you, um, how was it first released? Was it, was it something that you put out like, uh, as a video, 
I don't know if it was digital at the time or, you know, what did you do to release that? Like, here you go. Here's what, what we just did. Um, I was going on a tour. Uh, we had a tour booked for Europe, um, an Army of the Pharaohs tour. And I was putting together something like a mixtape as an exclusive for um, the fans in Europe mm. to buy at shows and only they would have it. Cause I thought that would be a cool way to not, they'd only have the physical, not the, I mean, obviously you would be able to hear it on YouTube or whatever, but I thought it'd be cool to have something for them. And that was a song that I had recorded anyway. And I figured that would be a good home for it on a CD. But I also wanted it to exist digitally because I wanted the message out there and I wanted to, um, you know, just be heard and make it clear where I, I stood on that issue. So I remember it's funny that you bring that song up because not, not a lot of people bring that bring that track up. But mm -hmm. I was on the plane about to, to fly to Europe to, to embark on the tour. And I was um, talking to my man, Will C, who crafted the video. And the video was taken from a lot of um footage from you know all types of different things i wasn't performing in the video the video was you know it got a little gruesome at points but i wanted to make of, of their posts and stuff yeah yeah and I, and i wanted um i wanted a video for it because it was important to me at that point and i said listen i'm flying over here now but if you can piece together something that i can put up on youtube as some type of a visual to accompany the song, it would be dope. And by the time I had landed and got settled in the hotel or whatever, he had something for me to look at. And it was the wow. video that he, you know, compiled with a lot of footage from the ugliness of the whole thing. And- uh, <laughs> The dark web. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, that's kind of where it came from, but, um, you know, so with that being said, as so were you shocked that it went that far with your words? The visual. Um, I don't know. I, I I'm but not sure. You really wanted to to hit that hard. It. I don't know because when you get in a certain headspace, when you're as you might know, when you're on on the road, and you're away from your house, your family, and your comfort zone it's tougher to focus on certain things. So I was probably gone for a month and a half at that point doing shows. And I was happy that he made a visual to go with the song. And I was like, well, I, I looked at it a couple of times and I said, well, I'm not in a position right now to go back and forth about this. And it's kind of time sensitive and I, I want mm -hmm. it out there. Let's, let's just, you know, let's, let's go. Uh, let's green light this and put it out. And it was just, uh, and then we did. And um, I'm not even sure if it's still up anymore. Cause I had, I had watched it before and I was like, you know, I don't, I, I just saw it today. <laughs> oh, really? I just saw it today. Yeah. I don't know if it's connected to my YouTube or somebody right. else put it up. Probably. I'm not sure how it exists, but um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. As far as, wolves dogs things like that 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 stuff is very important to me right. um hmm. and yeah I, i've the only time i probably watched that video is when i approved it and then i i might have started again that's when i was like i gotta take this down but apparently it's not down so i don't know no it's not man you're never gonna get it off there now oh no, right. no no it's a very important message and whatever yeah. you did it for at the time it still resonates today oh thank it's you still a need for that kind of commitment and stance uh animals to our own selves you know what i'm saying like we're just destroying everything you know i just want to uh finalize with this so um it's been an amazing conversation, man. And, and like I said, like there's a lot of parallel. I could go on forever with you, uh, but I'm going to let you eat dinner. Get back to your family. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Secret Wars in 96, man. So yeah. this is, you know, we both released vinyl at the same time. As far as I know, that's your first piece. Mm -hmm. 
and I did the same thing. And, you know, I was, I was a competitor. You were my competitor at the time. So, you know, this piece it is, it means something to me because this is where the parallel starts that I know of. Prior to that, we've got some similarities too, but when you did uh, Secret Wars, um, I was wondering how far back does the superhero uh, within you go? You know, what, what was your first memory of superheroes and, and being exposed to, to what that offers as something like escapism? And who was your, who was your dude or your woman, your superhero? Yeah, um, I, I would say it's an easy answer, but Spider-Man was always the, the guy, you know what I mean? Um, because even as early as the electric company, he had a Spider-Man guy that came out and he was very, uh, he didn't even speak, but he was a, a visual. I'm not even sure if Marvel and the electric company had this relationship, but there was a guy named Danny Seagreen that played Spider-Man on the electric company. And I was probably four or five years old. I was like, oh, this is Spider-Man guy. And then, you know, I started getting put in front of the TV where you would look at the first Spider-Man animation in terms of the series from 67. And then in 81, you had a, uh, the Spider-Man solo cartoon. And then after 81, it was Spider-Man and his amazing friends with Iceman and Firestar. Mm -hmm. And then I learned to read and started buying the, the comic books. So 83, 84, 85, 86. That was a big time for me in terms of buying comics. It wasn't so much collecting them, but it, just buying them to... to right read them for the thrill of it and something you know i have 50 cents yeah i'll yeah. buy this and then it was 75 cents or whatever but that era from probably 82 to 87 i don't know it was a point and then hip-hop took over and mm -hmm. then i realized i can actually put both of these things together right and that was secret wars you know but the peanut butter with the jelly <laughs> yeah, it was just like that whole that whole thing. And, and the reason that I can recall that stuff so easily year wise is due to the advent. Well, it's due to the Internet, you know, mm -hmm. I, like. If you tell if you told me when the first appearance of um, Spider-Man's symbiotic suit, the black suit came out, I like, I don't know, t five Six years ago, you, I couldn't tell you it was 84, but I mean, I have it. I remember it. I have my copy of it, but I, I couldn't tell you so quickly that it was 84. But I could just look on the internet and go, oh, that's right. That was 84. Right. But we're all old enough to, we don't need to prove that we were there because we were obviously there. Look at us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we came up with that. And, yeah. you know, it's like now you can kind of go back and be like, oh, that's right. Yeah, I did get that in 83 or whatever. Cause I remember that visually, I just didn't remember the date. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it was probably about a little more than a decade before Secret Wars actually came out. And the funny thing about Secret Wars is Last Emperor came out with a record called Secret Wars that was bigger than ours and probably more creative in a way. Mm. And it was produced by Mad Soul who actually produced our Secret Wars record. So Mad Soul produced both of those records. So it was always this thing where I was like, you went, you went and made this other Secret Wars record with this guy from, from uh, Philly. And he, you know, and he had this great concept of having uh, superheroes fight MCs, which was more, I, I, you know, a little bit better than what we were doing where we were just kind of rhyming about, you know, I'm doing this like Thor doing this right. like, you know, and, but it's, there it is. It's all in a time capsule now. How about uh, today? Is Spider-Man still your dude? Probably. And, it, you know, it's funny, man. As I said, my relationship with my son is just so... It's, it's strong, but the stuff that he's into, I get into. He's a huge Batman guy. And I, okay. I like Batman back then, too, but he loves Batman. So I gravitate towards Batman. And, like, when the pre... Say, just for an example, when the prequels, the Star Wars prequels came out, I didn't like them. Mm. I was not a fan of the prequels when they came out. I was oh, in the theater looking at them. And I, I know like, very well. I heard, right. I, heard of, I, heard, I heard plenty about that back in the <laughs> Yeah. I got an earful, man. Yeah. And, and uh, but he, you know, he's only 12, but 
he saw all these movies after the fact and he likes the prequels. And I'm mm. like, you know what? I like the prequels too. You know, I, I, Darth Maul's dope. And, and, and Qui-Gon Jinn, he, I love his story. And I can't wait for the new Obi-Wan series and, and Rebels mm. and Clone Wars and, you know, Lex, you know, <laughs> and all this stuff oh, yeah. became so much more uh, invigorating and exciting. And it's all kind of rooted in our relationship now. And it's, it's not like an excuse to still be into this stuff, but it's, it's, it, it just makes it that much more exciting when you can enjoy it with your kid in that way, you know? Right. Well, that's what George, that's what George Lucas said. That's what he said. He was, Mm -hmm. uh, he said that those movies were never made for people our age. He said, he, he, to this day, will still say that he made those for kids that, you know, for when, when we were at that age range, that's who he, made those movies for yeah yeah and my, my, my son was like what do you mean what what back then he was like what's wrong with jar jar Binks?" And i was like what do you mean what's wrong with jar what are you kidding me and and i was like i started <laughs> looking at through his lens and i'm like he's kind of cool he's cool i like that you know <laughs> i want ahmed best to be cool with the, with his whole role and thing and that was, you know <laughs> just... <laughs> and, uh, we yeah. can't we're more critics at this age than we were as children that's the whole difference. oh without a doubt we just talked about that with the music john you know the uh, yeah we're complaining just like our parents did same thing it's gonna repeat all the time man yes sir my last question for you my brother is uh what is your x-man power <sighs> um sarcasm <laughs> <laughs> no like um it's the irony of you saying that yeah <laughs> right <laughs> yeah um that was good that was good <laughs> right. yeah interesting that's it's a deep question because you have a lot of respect for for mutants and how mutants were um you know uh, they were metaphors you know in the grand scheme of things so it's like I don't know. I, you know, that's a good question. That's a okay. Good I'm football. gonna get back to you on that because <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. important to me. Yeah, next time, like we we Part all two. identify with our X Men powers at some point. So I'm gonna keep talking to you about that. That listen, you I would love to do this again sometime. It yeah, is, definitely. It's been a pleasure, and you know, uh, me and Alex go way back. So it, it, this would be a great great thing to do again if you ever needed me to do it again. I would love. I'd to love to that. have you on almost every single episode. We do okay. it once a month. <laughs> Not the interview part of it, but just to join us and be a part of the conversation, man. Because you bring yeah. to you bring a lot to the table. But um, tell it, give us a plug in, man. What you doing? Uh, you have some online stuff as well. Yeah, um, I'm at uh, at Zarface underscore so on Instagram and, and Twitter and and those things. And Zarface.com is the website where you can get our music and our, our merchandise and. Um, we uh, have a podcast called the Czarcast that uh, I, I, I run and, and curate and try to keep up with as often as I can. And uh, we've got new music on the way and that stuff I can't really announce yet, but I hope that everyone digs it when it drops because uh, we're excited about it. All right. And what can people expect when they go check out the podcast, the Czarface podcast? You know, um, just a lot of... Uh, a view into the developments that we're working on in, in terms of the, the music and the action figures and the comics and what we've mm-hmm. been up to. I, I talk about a lot of the things that are common ground for me and in, in Inspect the Deck and 7L, you know, the things that we relate to and relate on. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll weigh in on Star Wars a lot. Um, <laughs> right. the developments of the Mandalorian and things because that's the time frame that I was making start of the czar cast and it was just that whole uh star wars mcu thing was was really popping not that it's not now but that's the type of stuff i, I touch on a lot of pop culture stuff right you know um okay. well i'm definitely looking forward to sitting in on some of those episodes man i want to hear what you guys are up to current okay. cool uh, cool i'm a big fan man uh, <laughs> and, thank and, you man. <laughs> and within that big fan uh uh, perimeter is is the standard that you guys have so look yeah. for me uh look for me creeping up on your standards man <laughs> okay hey, hey listen man I, i'm 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 all ears man and <laughs> just to answer one 
one one quick thing that you had asked about how all of our music kind of is is an, a consistent level mm-hmm. is my relationship with deck and our um beats and where you know we 7l will play some crazy shit that i might be like all right let's go in this direction mm-hmm. and then once i say this is dope let's do it we'll play it for deck in the studio or whatever or i'll send it to him text right. text it to him or whatever and he might make a joke about it or something and i'm like ah <laughs> you know what let's just let's just bring it over this way we, you know we, we can't go that way <laughs> Hey, because he's a big influence to us. So, you know, if we get go too far left, he's going to bring us back this way. And, and we find some common ground that that way. So that's, that's a lot of us. I like that. The, that's I like the our face consistency. You know, we all like our face checks and balances. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> that's dope. I like that, man. Yeah. Hey, do you guys have any last things to holler at Esso? I'm good. But Poise, I think I'm good. Poise, unless you got anything else. No, I just I just want to say, brother, we appreciate you, man. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, wishing you happiness, man, and and uh, see you see you again soon. Hey, you too, man. You too. I, I would love to be back on the show, man, and, and learn more about everything and, and be part of this. So, uh, thank you for having me, guys. Well, thank I want you. you to be a part of the family, so we're gonna do that. Yes. Okay. Nope. Thank you. Thank you, nope. so right, folks. Appreciate you're it. Listening to Open Game episode number seven. Special guest esoteric uh from Zarface, yo. And we just had this amazing conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. And you heard it from the man himself. SO is coming back. Can't get enough of this, it's, man. It's a, yes, Live. sir. It's official now. <laughs> yep, it's official, man. He's a part of the family. We're gonna send you your chain real soon, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about how many times we've been, how many times we've been in New York City. <laughs> I've been in Love New York it. more times than you. <laughs> I know, uh, probably, man. That's not fair. I'm way on the other side. No, no, hey, I think I think love. you got me beat. <laughs> yeah, I know. All love to you and your family, man. Enjoy your dinner. Yes, sir. Uh, we'll be in touch, my brother. Thank you so much for joining us, man. Okay. All right, fellas. Right All right. On. All right, peace. <laughs>